Yeah, so thank you and welcome to the second TU community call or corner as, uh, as Larry called it the last time. Uh, I think we are going to have about an hour of uh, a few demonstrations and presentations and I will quickly share what I've been working on uh, since the last call. And after that, I'll give pass on the, the microphone to Daniel and Alessandro, who has um, um, agreed to do a few presenta presentations of their, uh, their work with, uh, with you. So what I've been primarily working on for um, since the last call is the Tailscale Android client. And for those of, uh, those of you who do not know Tailscale, it's, um, it's a company by a few ex-Googlers who wants to solve uh, VPN uh, the problem of having a, a stable and simple VPN connection between several devices or if you have several offices or data centers and so on. So the point about point with uh, uh, Tailscale is that you install the a client on either your desktop machines or your mobile phones and you sign in and after that you have a, a, a sort of encrypted virtual uh, LAN or VPN between all these devices that you have um, uh, connected on this, uh, that, that use the same sign in. And I'm, what I'm working on is the Android client, the Android version of, uh, of the Tailscale network. And I'm, I think I'm going, to have, uh, I'm going to be able to release a beta version uh, at the end of May. And the client is also going to be open source. In fact, it's already um, sort of open source in, in my own uh, unlisted repository on SourceHat. But after the beta, um, after releasing the the version that is that is uh, ready to test by the public, I think that the the code will be moved over to the to the Tailscale GitHub uh, repository. I can send you a link or post it on the video recording afterwards. Um, yeah, so I didn't get. I'm, I'm usually I work on on a, on my main machine is a Linux machine where the emulator the Android emulator works well enough to run uh, these things. But apparently, in typically demo, the demo gods is not with me today. So what I can show you is just shortly how this uh, Android client works on the emulator as it runs on this Mac. Let's see if I can share the screen. Present now. Right. So I hope you can see my screen now. So this is just a very basic emulator where you have no none of the Google services installed, and that, I think that's one of the problems that that I'm facing with uh, getting it to run probably. But uh, it's it's a basically a, a normal Android client. Uh, normal Android app with an icon and so on, but all the the the, the graphical interfaces, of course, been implemented with Geo, and um, and the backend, uh, all the backend code is is Tailscale's own Go packages for connecting and and communicating with their own backends and creating these um, encrypted tunnels and VPN connections to their own services. And if you have the ability or the, the connectivity, they, they also allow you to, to create peer-to-peer -peer connections to your other devices. So this is the this is actually more or less a copy of the, the iOS, their existing iPhone uh, application. And as I said, it, it doesn't really allow me to run the browser, the browser that, that you can log in with, but this is, so this is just the, the UI as it, as it uh, looks like when you have no internet connection. And the, the intention is that in this wide area with the, with the connection warning, there's a list of your, your peers, your other devices that you can search in. And of course, there is a menu for copying your IP address. You can copy your device's IP addresses. But the basic, the, the client is not really uh, the, the focus of, um, of, of this product. The, the idea is that you just log in, make sure that your connection, uh, that your authentication token is, uh, is current, and then it runs in the background using Android's VPN um, service. So you, you more or less create a VPN connection, give it to the Android system, and that allows you to go, for example, use a browser.
access to connect all the other devices that you have in your network. And I think the interesting part of um, things that you may not have seen yet um, done um, with GU that is that has, has actually been possible since almost I think the beginning of the release is that the tail scale client is not um, is, is you, you build the, the tail scale client with go GU which, which is the command that you use for building um, complete Android applications so let, let me just show you how the GU example is built uh, something like this you say go to you target Android and then the kitchen example I say a while on this slow Mac mm -hmm. so the point is that you just run one command and, and from that command comes uh, comes an APK in in the tail scale example, you actually, I have a build script here, you run go to you in build mode archive, which looks a bit like the C archive or the C, um, what's it called, C shared mode uh, for the go command and still target Android. Um, but from that comes out an AR, which is an Android archive, which can then be included in a main, um, main Android application so that you have an easier access to um, as you just show you have an easier access to to make a custom android man manifest xml with your permissions and your uh, android services and so on so because this client has to have a tighter integration with the android system i i chose to reverse the 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 control so that the android the native android project is is primary and the uh, the GU stuff, the Go uh, libraries, is included as an uh, as an Android archive. You can see if you, okay, it's done over here. So so this is just a, the Kitchen APK is a complete application which you can just install. And in this example, uh, you run first your archive. I'll put it into the RPN uh, archive, uh, Android archive, and then you run Gradle to actually assemble the the finished APK with this archive included. Right, so the next thing um, I'm going to, after re releasing this uh, beta version of this, there's also already been a few uh, modifications to GU itself because of this work. For example, the, the clipboard access read write that I did um, about a week ago, a few days ago, is, uh, is motivated by Tailscale needing to access, to write to the clipboard for, for Tailscale um, IP addresses. And I think going forward, I'm going to work a bit on the editor, have um, have better support for copy paste, for selections, for um, and better integration with the Android keyboard, perhaps also the iPhone uh, uh, ditto, the, the, the equivalent uh, keyboard access on iPhone, where you ask for the simple keyboard interface where the Android keyboard will just give each and every character as you press them. But in reality, what you want to give the Android system access to is, is a selection of your, or at least the, a part or the whole of your editor so that it can do uh, spell checking, it, it can do um, uh, predictive uh, text entering and so on. So that kind of tighter integration is, is definitely in the, uh, in the near future. Um, so what else, what else? I think I'm going to pass it over to Daniel, who should be doing a presentation and demonstration about his uh, integration tests, his end-to-end -end testing. Do you want to take questions about your thing first? Because I, I do have a question. Yeah, let's do a few questions then. I, I want the hard questions to come after your demonstration so that we are sure not to go over time. But let's just do a few questions now. OK, uh, the only quick one I had is, I imagine most Android apps will have to modify the manifest XML to some degree. So is GU going to make that easier from the side of Go? Or is it always going to be just, no, if you're on your own, you have to build an AAR, and then? So right now, uh, there's actually already support for doing um, for including permissions in the manifest. 
by important uh, special uh, geo packages. You just do the underscore important porting of the sub packages within the permission main package. And that those imports are then translated into permissions for, for the Android manifest. And I believe there's also, but I actually don't remember that, but I believe, I believe there is a, uh, an ability to have just the Android manifest in your main package that you're building. And if you have that file in the, in the same directory as, as the Go package you're building, then that will be used instead. But if it, if, if it isn't there, Yet it will. Uh, I think that's a very reasonable feature. But uh, what I also know is available is that you can, if you have jar files, so um, Java archives with compiled Java code inside, you uh, they are also automatically included with uh, without using the archive mode. Any more questions? Right. We'll just um, go over to you, Daniel. Cool. Just one sec. So I assume I can see terminal. Stop me if that's not the case. So what I've been working on for the last, I guess, few months now is essentially adding end-to-end -end tests to Geo. And the idea is that Geo does have its own tests, but if something breaks, such as you know the API for Android or the API for X11, or if somebody introduces a small regression, they might be really hard to catch uh, via just unit tests. So I'm going to do an underwhelming demo first, which is that if I run Go test, <laughs> you won't see anything, but it's going to take a while. And it passes, so OK. Uh, so what did it do? So if we run it again, it does a bunch of stuff. Again, not still not very interesting. But the interesting part is, and this is you're going to see some flashing windows and lights. So if anybody um, is sensitive to that, please um, look away. So essentially, if I do go test run end to end uh, headless false. You see a bunch of windows with flashing lights. And the one that goes the slowest is obviously Windows, because that's Wine. And Wine has to do a bunch of extra work. So I wanted to show a single one of them to get a better feel of exactly what happens. So for example, if we do go with Wayland, this one is pretty fast. And you can't even see what happens. But um, if we look at the code, uh, so essentially, you've got we've got a, a test driver uh, with some with some basics, but the only portable bits that each test runs is starting a geo app, taking a screenshot, and then clicking in some coordinates. And the width and height are right now fixed. So essentially, if we look at, for example. Uh, da -da 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 -da. So what we do is we grab an initial screenshot. Uh, we check that the colors are what they we think they should be. Because what this app does is what this app does is it's something it's something really dumb. It just shows a bunch of colors, and if you click on any of them, it just changes the color to red and back uh, when you click again. And every time you, you any time it redraws the frame, it just prints Q frame ready. And the reason for that is that then the end-to-end -end test can know that it's finished redrawing, so it can then grab a screenshot. So if we slow this down a bit, um, and then we rerun the Wayland test, you will see that happening. Oh, you will not see that happening. Anyway, oh, that doesn't happen in the Wayland test. My bad. Uh, da, 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 da. Click, 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 click. Where did that happen? I forgot where my code is. Anyway, moving on. So the last thing I wanted to show as part of the demo is that there's also an Android end-to-end -end test. 
uh, it's a little bit harder to run because Android emulators, like Elias showed earlier, they can be a little bit finicky. And they're also really expensive to start up. Whereas starting a browser or Wine can take a few seconds. Starting a new emulator might take like a full minute. So the only thing that's implemented right now is that it connects to ADB. Um, it connects via ADB to any existing um, device. So what I'm going to do now is you might not see this very well because it's my physical device, but I'm going to hold my device to the screen, uh, sorry, to the camera, and then I'm going to run the uh, the Android. Uh, is that good enough? Yeah. So I can see that, but you should hopefully see an app popping up in a few seconds and then some colors. And again, that was pretty quick, but um, it works. So that's pretty much it for now. Um, it takes about eight seconds. It covers some of the main platforms. It doesn't cover Apple because I don't have any Apple machine to test with. Um, it doesn't cover it doesn't cover real Windows because again, getting a real Windows machine can be tricky. Um, I plan on doing an Android emulator, but I need to see how difficult that would be to reuse and cache properly. And I would like to test Firefox as well. We only test Chrome for now, um, but that's pretty much it. Any questions, any ideas? I have one question. Oh. Sorry. Good. Uh, I have one. Uh, do you know about um, the, the the standard Go uh, distributions, uh, Android testers? They use, uh, I think it's Dockerized Android builders. So perhaps you can. Uh, it's it would be able to. You'll be able to reuse those. Yeah, maybe. I I did look at it a few months ago, but I I found it kind of overkill for our purposes. But I, I should probably look at it again because that was a while ago. And I think they um, as as part. I, I did some of the work of implementing that uh, emulator on uh, running tests. The the Go standard libraries test on the emulator, and I th I believe the 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 people behind doing the Android emul emulator has been working towards making it more headless friendly. So it had, they have a bunch of flags doing so they don't uh, store any data and they uh, they run headless and they uh, try to, to to optimize the startup time. So I believe. But I don't know. I believe you will have uh, not too many problems doing a, a simple test like like the red red uh, dot go. I, I did run some tests with the SDK emulator, and mm -hmm. it does support running headless mode because after all, it's an X eleven application. Uh, but the problem is that it's still pretty slow to start up a new emulator because you have to set up its disk, you have to you have to boot it, you have to do everything from scratch. So it might still take even in an SSD and with everything pre downloaded. Might still take like thirty seconds. Larry, did you have a question? Yeah, um, you mentioned. I mean, you use Wine. You don't have a Windows machine. Um, would a Windows VM be sufficient? Uh, so I have some ideas on how um, CI could be done better. So, for example, um, GitHub Actions on Google. Uh, GitHub Actions on GitHub um, has CI for free on Mac and Windows. So we could potentially use that to continuously test Geo Master with those real machines. Um, the problem then is, how do I develop that without a real machine next to me? Uh, I guess connecting to one somewhere in the on, on the world, around the world, would be fine. But I don't have one right now. It also looked like uh, you said you were um, printing a message whenever you finished a screen redraw and you were moving the mouse around and not redrawing. And I've done that on my app and maybe I misunder misunderstood, but whenever I uh, move the mouse, I get lots of screen redraws. Did I misunderstand there? Well, I should clarify. Um, the printing is not whenever Gio has to do work. It's only when I changed the um, what's shown, if that makes sense. So when I change a color right. and then issue a, a new frame, then I print something. OK. OK. I was just wondering how you managed to not do a refresh with the mouse moving all around. I was jealous. <laughs> I mean, you can you can look at the test app source code if you want. I did it a, a while ago, and I'm not an expert by any means. It's pretty simple. No worries. Thanks. 
And the only last thing I wanted to bring up, um, given that there are no more questions, is that what are the next steps in terms of what else we could cover? Obviously, other platforms, but also in terms of GUI features. I was thinking inputting text, uh, typing something, and then seeing that it prints the same thing. And the other thing that comes to mind that might be useful as an end-to-end -end test would be um, resizing the window. So for example, making it half as wide and then taking a screenshot and seeing that it uh, it got redrawn properly. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, Larry, did you refer to the fact that uh, that right now when you have a, a mouse listener or pointer listener active, then as the, the simple act of moving your cursor around will redraw? Is that so? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, I think uh, if I remember correctly, Daniel's end-to-end -end tests do not use pointer listeners. The, uh, I think he just watches the global pointer events that comes uh, from the event queue, uh, the window event queue. Is that correct? Yeah, I I tried to not use high-level wrappers because this is supposed to test only the bits that are platform specific, platform specific. If that makes sense. Yeah. So I don't want to use any high-level widgets because those are already tested through into it through unit tests. And I think uh, it's all. It, it was also you, Larry, that brought up the uh, the issue of having too many redraws just for moving the the mouse around. And I can say that we are moving towards not ha having that, uh, not doing that every time the mouse uh, the mouse moves because um, at you recently got support for enter and leave events so that you can register. Just you can be if you're just interested in enter and leaves. I would like to add a feature that says so. So when you register a pointer listener. You, you you also give it a mask, a sort of mask of, of which kind of inter events you're interested in. And as long as your listener is not interested and not registers for move events, then automatically uh, those redraws shouldn't happen uh, anymore. Nice. Cool. I look forward to it. So let's move on to, uh, if you have nothing else, uh, Daniel. OK, let's move on to, to you, Alessandro, um, and your demonstration. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, great. So um, does it work? We can see you, at least. But not the screen. Not the screen, not yet. Mm. Perhaps you can shortly introduce. Uh, OK, okay you're, you're presenting. So uh, what I'm going to show is um, the Delve, which is a user interface for uh, for Delve, a graphical user interface for Delve. So I'm going to just start it. And Delve is the Go debugger. Uh, it's a debugger for Go. Yeah. This is what it looks like. It's heavily inspired by other, you know, full screen. Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> For, by other uh, graphical uh, standalone debuggers. It has a bunch of panels, as you can see here. It, this one is uh, uh, the source code listing. And here we have a stack trace and the list of breakpoints, local variables, and the command window. Uh, a big inspiration for this was WinDBG, if anyone has ever seen that. Mm -hmm. And uh, when these windows are, are docked like this, when you resize one, Everything else resizes to fill up the space, but you can also tear one off and it becomes a floating window, which can be resized or closed. This is not everything that the debugger can do. For example, if I give the command uh, win go, it opens a list of go routines, and this is also a floating window, which we can move here and it docks, for example. And uh, if you go into the command window, you can give commands. And if you do like this, it moves through the code, executing one line at a, at a time. And you can see here in the local variables windows, the variables appear as they enter into scope, into visibility. And uh, um, yeah, so this, this thing has a feature parity with the command line client of, of Delve. So I'm not going to go into all the features that it has because it's quite a long list. Uh, it basically can, you know, step inside function outside, do 
uh, reversible re recording and replay with uh, Mozilla RAR. It can uh, call functions, everything that Delft can do, this thing can do. But this is not about debuggers. I mean, this meeting is not about debuggers. So I'm naturally going to show a user interface thing instead. If you go into the configuration window, we can change the theme. But I think either this one is the default theme or this one is the default theme. Uh, and we also have this theme here, which is all red and black if you want to feel like a hacker. <laughs> let's let's do <laughs> this one. And so um, you are probably thinking that this doesn't look like a, a GIO application very much. The reason is that this was written all the way back in 2016 before GIO existed. And what it used to do is it would render everything uh, on the CPU and then display it using Shiny. And I rec recently ported to GIO. In fact, actually, uh, by default, it still renders using the CPU on Windows and Linux. But you can switch it to use GIO uh, at compile time. In On macOS, it's the opposite. It uses GIO by default, and you can switch it back to Shiny if you want. So I was listening to uh, last month, uh, the recording of last month me meeting. And I think uh, Elia said that it didn't take me uh, a long time to do the port. So I thought I would show uh, what the port look like, looks like. And since, uh, I mean, this is also a debugger presentation, uh, I thought I would do it from inside the debugger because actually debuggers are pretty good for reading code instead of using an editor. So what we are going to do is we are going to do to go inside this directory. So this is a, a small application that uh, demos uh, the widget toolkit for, that I used for the debugger, which is called Nuclear, by the way. So we're going to debug this. Going to recompile it. So we're going to remove this. And if we run it, uh, so now this application is running inside the debugger, and uh, nothing is going to happen. Of, happen, of course, uh, unless it crashes. But so we are going to stop it and set a breakpoint on context .draw, which is the function that actually does draws the inside of the window. So when we restart the application now, the first time that it tries to actually draw, it will stop inside the debugger. And there we are. <clears throat> so this is the draw function. First off, uh, it gets called from this function here, which is called update locked. And what this does is it loops through the queue of events from GIO and converts them into a format that's expected from nuclear applications. And then over here, it, this is eventually going to run the uh, user code that does the layout of the window. And this call here uh, is the actual drawing of the inside of the window. And how it works is it takes uh, this context.commands in input, which is a list of essentially calls to drawing primitives. We can take a look at it uh, like this. So this is all uh, draw calls, essentially. For example, this one is drawing a field rectangle. If we look inside it, we can see that the rectangle is this position here, yeah, at x183 uh, and epsilon uh, y5, y7, these dimensions. And it's going to be with this color and with, without rounded uh, coordinates. If we look at another command, this one here, this is a text command, so it's going to draw some text, and the position of the text is over here. And if we look here, we can see oops, the font, and this is thing. So essentially, this command is requesting that we draw the string theme at these coordinates. And what this uh, function does, it loops over this list of commands and converts them into geo operations. So as you can see here, we have this code here that draws lines. 
you see it here draws uh, field rectangles, triangles, and circles. It's very low level. <clears throat> and if we let it run all the way to here, so at this point, this, this list has been converted. And if we take a look at, uh, at the ops struct, we can see how it looks like. And this is the contents. And we can also do, so it's like it's uh, 14,000 ops, I guess. <laughs> And if you look at it, we can also look at them as if they were output by text stamp. And this is what it looks like. And I have no idea what it is, but I mean, presumably if you are developing a GIO, you know. And that's all I wanted to say. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing. So um, I I want at, before questions I just want to point out the operations list is uh, as you as you probably know it's an encoded list of your commands so it's it's I think it's for fourteen uh, k of commands uh, the, the commands take up fourteen thousand bytes but I don't think that's fourteen thousand commands yeah because it has also the arguments right yeah yeah right. so mm -hmm. it's uh, the commands themselves are say a few bytes and then some of the commands can take quite a lot of space. For example, the, the clip commands, they take a, a floating point for each uh, coordinate and so on. So, but, but it's correct. It's more or less correct, correct that that operations buffer con contains all the commands, uh, but just in an in encoded form. Mm -hmm. So any questions for Alessandro? Yeah, so that looks really neat. And it looks like you've sort of re-implemented um, Windows or something similar to Windows I think they call it multi-document mode. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's uh, is that, yeah, nobody uses the terminology anymore. I think. <laughs> right. Is that is that it? It it still looks useful though. Um, is that separate from Dell? Can anybody use that? Is that easy, easily separable? So uh, that's all inside the that library that I was talking about, which is called the Nucular, which is on my GitHub. So. Uh, First of all, actually, this nothing of none of this is part of Delve. This is a separate project to make a user interface for Delve. To be clear, although I also contribute to Delve, but this is separate. And uh, yeah, your question: This is a separate library called Nucular, N U C U L A R, and uh, yeah, anyone can use it, but. Uh, the thing is, if you do use it, you're on your own. Uh, uh, I do not take feature requests or requests for help. And the documentation is intentionally sparse to discourage people that will not be self-sufficient. Uh, that's how it is. <laughs> I don't have time for that. Sorry. <laughs> Got it. Thanks. So I have a question. I think you answered. Uh, we discussed this uh, on email at some point. But could you clarify or or expand upon why um, TU is used primarily on macOS and not on the other platforms, or why it's it's not shiny all around? So um, shiny uh, has and well used to have i do not know if it still does but had some problems on mac os where it would occasionally crash when you're resizing the window uh, and it's not exactly actively maintained a, a lot currently so i thought i would just switch to Geo by default on mac os and to be fair at this point i would i could switch to Geo on every platform actually uh, there is no problem with it. I've been using the Geo backend myself uh, for quite a long time. The only thing that's keeping me from it is that, um, you know, personal taste. I think the uh, the font rendering is too light for my taste. You you cannot tell from from my demo because I was using uh, input medium as a font, which is a quite black font. But if you're using uh, lighter fonts, then input medium, which is pretty much every font in existence, except input medium, it's going to be lighter than, for example, a free type rendering. 
So that, that's the only thing. I think uh, I don't think that's just personal taste. I think we discussed that on uh, that particular problem in the last call, uh, where we discussed that uh, in particular when you when you render um, text on low DPI monitors or screens, then the the text will will almost surely be too light or too um, um, not readable enough at least, not legible enough. So what what is missing is not so much a, person, a question of taste, but simply the, the, a very common feature in free type and, and similar libraries where you take text at a certain size, at a certain resolution, and expand uh, the stems of the of the letters a little bit uh, to make it to make it more clear, to make it uh, darker uh, on those screens. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Alessandro? No? Right, so let's move on to um, to just the general discussion. If anybody wants to bring up uh, anything related to you, have questions for me or anyone else on this call, then uh, just uh, go ahead. Hello, this is Anthony. Hi, yeah. everyone. Hi. Uh, one of the things that uh, I know we talked earlier is having a sort of canvas-like API for, mm -hmm. for Geo. Um, I've got some notes on what that might look like. Um, is anybody else working on that or is anybody else interested in that? Just, just asking. I'm very interested in, in that. Okay. If you want, I can send you my notes just to see sort of what, what the methods would look like, what the API would look like, coordinate systems and that kind of thing. Um, so um, that, I'm very interested in doing that as well, if, if anybody else would like to work on that. Uh, do you know if, um, if, you, if, you, if you can, it would be help to send uh, your notes to either the mailing list or the, 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 the issue tracker, just so everyone else can, uh, can follow. I would do on. that. I yeah. do that. Um, and the second question is, uh, do you have any idea of uh, the amount of low-level support from the rendering, um, rendering feature-wise, what would be needed from your... Um, so so, so you wouldn't need that much from what I can tell. You need the ability to uh, render text, which you can do already. Um, basically, render text uh, at an arbitrary um, place at an arbitrary size, which I think is already there. Mm -hmm. um, you need a method to, to draw lines, obviously. So the, the high level functions that I have in mind are uh, text. Um, and in the graphics ability, you'd have the ability to draw an ellipse, a rectangle, polygon, line, arcs, and curves. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally be able to, to place a, a raster image. That would be it. So I think all of the building blocks are there. Um, so it's just a matter of what that API would look like um, to be able to do stuff. So I've, I've tested this sort of concept with some other um, goal toolkits and it seems to work okay. Um, and I've done it you know, for, for other things as well. So I, I would really love to, to, to work on this or work with folks on this if they're interested. That would be very. Uh, that, that would be very great. Um, do we have um, Do we have an idea of uh, whether it uh, your library, your Canvas library, will make it uh, easier to convert something like SVGs to? Um... It it could be. It could be. So it um, it's very sort of orthogonal to SVG. So yeah, you could use it to render SVGs if you like. I would say. Um, I can share my screen if you like. I can show you sort of the notes quickly if you can. Let's, let's see it. Let's see it. Okay. Uh, let's see. Present now. Okay. I was also wondering if you had a specific use case in mind for this. I do. I do. So I've got um, tools that I've been working on um, called DEC which is a, uh, a, a markup language for doing presentations and information displays. Um, and on top of that, I have uh, a DSL called Deck Shell. Um, and then from there, you can do all kinds of other things for, um, for doing information displays, gener generative art, and that kind of thing. Okay, can people see my screen okay? Yes. 
Okay, so so here it is, um, and I've used this this sort of um, API for for lots of things as well. So, beginning with the coordinate system, it's a little bit different from most graphics libraries. It's kind of the one that you um, you learned in school, where the origin is here, and everything is percentage based. That's really important for how scaling works. Um, so the the API only has to understand numbers from zero to 100. Um, and it will automatically scale depending upon what the aspect ratio is. Okay, so that's the coordinate system. So text is, is pretty simple. Um, you need to be able to specify font color and size and then alignment, beginning, centered, and end. One of the things it doesn't really talk about very well is uh, right to left or left to right kind of texts. Um, so that's probably something that can be worked on. For graphics, these are the primitives. Um, you need to be able to do an ellipse, a rectangle, polygon line, arc, and curve. Um, squares and circles obviously can be de derived from um, ellipses and, and rectangles. Um, you can have an image and you place it um, anywhere on the canvas and you have the ability to scale it again in a zero to 100%. Colors, um, we can do, you know, whatever sort of works for the API as in our GBA. And I also like to work very much in SVG named colors. So you can just say red, green, so forth. Um, finally, transformations. And this is something um, that we can leave for later, um, but perhaps something to think about is being able to do translation scales and rotations. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's important. Um, but you can kind of work around that if you don't have them. Um, so in the coordinate systems, all of the, for data types, all of the dimensions are floating point, uh, ranging from numbers from zero to 100. Degrees and rotation are also in floating point, and RGBs are in the, the typical ones. Mm -hmm. And there's a list of the, the API right there. So it's, it's surprising what kind of richness you can do with just these few things. Um, you can do a lot of very interesting things with those. So, so that's it. So do you, do you already, um, you mentioned you already have implementations of, uh, of this. I do, right? yeah. I do, I do have this um, again for, for other toolkits. I, I mean, I can show it if, if you like. Um, no, no. My question is more: sure. uh, you, you already actually have the API running. So, is this uh, for the geo case? Would this be a question of um, sort of uh, connecting the API with another backend? Or no, 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 no. So it would. So the idea would be if we can use geo as the backend to implement this this sort of list of methods. That's all. Mm -hmm. okay. That would that would be the desire. So for example, I did a limited version of this with the fine toolkit. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it seemed to work okay. So I was able to do, but there are limitations, for example, they don't have all of the primitives um, and you can't do everything, but you can, you, I can do it. For example, I can have a slide viewer um, mm -hmm. that, that works with the deck markup mm -hmm. um, and that works pretty well. So what I can tell just from the skimming your document there is that, that what is primarily missing from the GU API right now is uh, is more transformations, so rotation and okay. scaling. Yeah, yeah. Which shouldn't be that hard. It, it just hasn't, uh, they just haven't been implemented yet. And then da, 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 you have Polygon. Polygon is not, it's, it could just be a clip path really. A line sure. is also implementable, not very efficiently, but I'm not. Uh, I'm sure that you don't care that much about efficiency at the first in the Correct. first version, right? Correct. So I think ellipse, rects, and polygon, and lines, and arcs, and curves. Yeah, so qu quadratic uh, Bashir curves are already in the in the clipping API. So I think just just for, from looking at this, is the only missing things uh, are scale and rotation. Sure. So it should be implementable. Perfect.
So uh, again, I, I'll be honest, I tried to, to start to do this and I did get kind of stuck on, on, on how to lay out the canvas appropriately and so forth and managing the, the, the state and so forth. So I think if, um, you're, if, if you start up a, an issue at, uh, at in the issue tracker or uh, do you know we, uh, about the Slack channel? Are you in? Uh, I'm in not, Slack? I'm not. I don't, okay. I don't know about that one. Okay, so the Slack channel is uh, is the Gopher, the ordinary Gopher Slack, um, what you call a group workspace, and the channel name is uh, GUI, uh, hashtag GUI, where there are about hundred hundreds hundred people, um, and me nice. including. So if you start out with an issue or to the mailing list and with some, what you have and what you're stuck with, I'm sure that we can uh, get uh, get it moving. Perfect. And I'm also very interested in, in having scaling and rotation and so on. So it's not something um, I have planned for in, in, in my immediate, in the immediate plans, but I could probably uh, push those fe features forward if, um, if you need them. Great. Thanks. All right. Good. OK. I'll stop. And any, any questions for Anthony? Right, so we have about um, 10 minutes left. If anyone else wants to bring up um, issues, questions, uh, f features, uh, future work, and, and so on. So Larry, last time you, uh, you had an issue about, uh, about uh, multiple windows, that you wanted to have multiple window support in, in TU. Uh, and I think I mentioned it on on Slack already, but uh, because I had to rework m m much of the backends for for implementing uh, clipboard access, I actually got multiple windows to work on Linux, so for uh, the X11 and Wayland backends. And I don't think it would be that hard to make uh, multiple windows work on 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 Mac OS and uh, and Windows. Yeah, I'm looking forward to giving that a look. I haven't uh, I haven't had a chance to do much. Uh... Uh, programming on my app in, in about a week. Um, okay, but uh, but I think if it if it works at all on Linux, and I assume you've like reworked the API so that at least there's you know um, the rest of the API is compatible, and you just need to, to implement the, the the lower level stuff. Yeah, sure. It's it's one of those changes where the, a lot of, of of the work is going to be under the hood. And the actual user visible change is just that multiple calls to new window will work. Um, and it's uh, and I think uh, the GU model uh, uh, actually does work uh, well for multiple windows. I did a, 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 a quick demonstration for myself just to verify that it actually worked. And the, the neat thing is that you can that you have a channel for each window. So, to, but but because this is Go, you can have either have uh, multiple windows controlled by the same for select loop and not have multiple Go routines running. Or if you want uh, more independent win windows, you can have a Go routine per window. So I think uh, support these uh, this uh, multiple calls to a new window. Then it it will work quite uh, work out quite nicely. Oh, and and another thing I wanted to bring up is uh, if whether anyone have uh, questions or. Uh, questions about uh, the upcoming change to the to the widget type. So so uh, throughout uh, GU you use this uh, these function literals for expressing sub uh, widgets. So if you have an a, 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 for example a uniform inset or an inset or a stack or a flex any any layout type, it takes a, a function that turn nothing, and within that you draw whatever you want inset or laid out in a line or uh, done the uh, layout operations too, and I can if I can just see if I can find it very very quickly. The entire screen here. Da, 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 da. So, if you can't see my shell right now, speak up. So what I'm talking about is these functions that you give to all these layout functions. So this is a button layout that lays something out from inside this function and then puts a button uh, look around it. Uh, and down here we have a flex for putting things on either in either a column or a row. 
And for each element, it takes these uh, anonymous, um, uh, these functional literals that take no arguments. And the proposal is to change that into, I could just write this type widget. I think, I think I actually have, I have implemented some of that. So if I can find this, it's then the dot functional widgets. You can see it in here. The change will be that instead of using these um, functional literals that take no arguments and return nothing, the proposal is to, to, to change those into one that takes an explicit context with the constraints changed uh, for this for the content of it that also returns a dimensions. And the trick I, that I am using to make this uh, acceptable, at least to me, is to have, let's see if I can find the definitions. Oh, yeah. I'm using type aliases to shorten the dimensions and context type. And that's why we can have something that, at least to me, be more acceptable uh, in terms of, of, uh, of characters, number of characters. Can you clarify what's the advantage of doing it that way, as opposed to just anonymous? So the, dis so, so the, dis yeah, the disadvantage of the old uh, of the way that it works today is that the constraints and dimensions are um, indirectly specified. They are contained in the in the global context. So if you have uh, for a kitchen function today, uh, the kitchen app uh, today, you have somewhere up here you have this context that you uh, see. I can present. Mm -hmm. So right now you have one single context that you can um, that you declare at the beginning of your program, and that function is passed into all your sub layouts and 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 sub widgets and so on. And here it is again. But it's always a point a pointer. And the convention is that as soon as you enter one of these uh, these sub functions or function uh, literals, the context will have changed its constraints. Let's see if we can find the dog. So this is the context type. It it includes the constraints and the dimensions. And the constraints are actually they should be arguments to each of these functions. But it isn't because of of, uh, of the typing overhead and because you use these functional literals all over the place in, in, in geo programs. So the proposal is actually to make this explicit uh, in the sense that this context is turned into a value type that you pass to each and every of these functions and also makes the, the return value, which today belongs in a, is, is placed context as being into actual return arguments um, from these functions. Let's see if I can find it again. So again, you, 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 these functions are uh, you change these functions to take an uh, implicit context value because there's no pointer in here and you make them return, you force them to re return an actual dimension so that you never, you're never in doubt of what is the current contents of your constraints. You never run into problems about, um, of restoring constraints or have stale constraints from, from some other thing that, that, that And for example, you are, uh, in this example, you can see there's a, a return of D. In the previous kitchen, there's no, no one that forces you to return any dimensions for these. Uh, it's just expected that you set it. You set the dimensions in your context. And if you don't do that, then the layouts will just be off. In the new, in the proposal, you are, because there's a return type, you're forced to return something. So it's it's much harder to forget to, um, to set your dimensions because you're forced to return it. If you go this route, that kind of looks like a DSL. I wonder if doing something like Exposing a package that's meant to be imported as as a as a dot import might be useful, so that people don't have to redefine the type aliases. That's a good idea. So that's building upon the proposal, right? Just to be clear. 
or do you mean something that has the the types? Uh, <laughs> no. I, I know dot imports are evil, but I think for DSLs within that constrained um, use case, they might be useful. My my point about um, it could it may be, but my my what I like about the type aliases is that you can you can decide how much you think they suck on a on a case by case basis. So I think they're worth it in time in terms of typing. But if you have a, a project where you <laughs> um, if you have a project where you you think that typing out the longer names is acceptable, then or if you have fewer of these literals uh, in your programs, I still use the full um, types here for these top level methods, just to be very clear what where, what this context and the dimensions, what they actually are. So I only intend to use these type aliases um, for all these closures, these functional literals. But I, I meant the dot import as completely optional, by the way. It's just a matter of, in terms of reading um, GEO code, if everybody uses their own different type aliases, it's, it's going to be hard because then you have to get accustomed to all the aliases. But if everybody uses the same set of short aliases, it might be easier. You have anything to say, Paul? <laughs> no, I. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it went, I didn't see the comments. I've only seen the comments. You're making me want to use dot <laughs> Um And it's, it's. Um, I mean, Daniel's more aware of uh, the implications of dot imports than I am. It just, it makes it much harder for um, tool authors who are then analyzing source code to to do anything if you've got dot imports. Um, because you you require more context when trying to understand where an identifier is defined, um, because you totally you know, not blow away the scope. Because of course it's it's more nuanced than that. But um, that's that's part of the reason why they're not so friendly. Is that it then makes it that step that bit harder to actually write tools on top tools that are at least easy to write in any case, because if you're having to deal with dot imports all over the place, you have to resolve where an identifier is actually defined. But you mean some sort of custom or ad hoc tools, right? Because something like yeah, exactly. uh, GoPlease has to be able to deal with uh, dot imports anyway, right? Yeah, exactly. It's just people who would write, anybody who might um, care to write a tool, for example, that works with GU code, then if, if you're making dot imports a common thing and encouraging people to do it, every tool has to be um, able to deal with dot imports, which, okay, it's not the end of the world, but it's just you just place more of a burden on the, um, the, the tool author in that situation. So I'm, I'm speaking for the tool authors out there, of which Daniel, <laughs> ironically, is one of them. And I think uh, Egon has been... Uh spoke out about the type aliases being very very ugly so we have we have kind of case of, 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 of three of three choices either keep the longer names use type aliases use start imports or as you can just suggested maybe shortening the package and the type names themselves can I suggest uh, two mm -hmm. two alternatives um, mm -hmm. one is the um, the the issue that you've commented on that people might be interested in reading which and rogers also commented on it as well which is the the function literals um uh, where you uh, miss out the type specification so where it's known what the type is uh, and a function is being passed as an argument then you can effectively pass um uh what's the word i'm after um, Are you talking about the uh, echo issue? Uh, yeah, there's a go issue. Go. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's an issue about a proposal for the Go language itself, right? Correct, yeah. Yes. So it's, it, that's obviously a language change, so it's, it's a much longer term thing. The second alternative is actually to use Go Please, where Go Please in um, a deep completions mode can actually understand thank you lambda was the word i was after i don't know why i was having a, a total brain fart there um go please in a deep completion mode can actually complete the function for you um if fully and put your cursor in the position of the function body 
So effectively, a way that the Go Police folks have answered this question is to say, um, don't worry about it, because if you attempt completion at the point where the function argument is expected, it will complete for you the full function with um, the parameters named as um, um, uh, as they are in the actual uh, function signature that, that you're calling. Um, and then we'll leave the cursor in the position of the function body, which is pr precisely what you want in that situation. So that's an alternative. Yeah, that, that, but that uh, alternative only solves the typing part, right? It does, yes. Yeah, so, so what I'm concerned is two things, the typing part and what it looks like on the page when you read your code. I don't want to be, oh. to be too, too distracted by having these two types uh, repeated over and over and over. And that's why, I, because I knew that it, it would be a problem to have these, this context that where you implicitly change the constraints and dimensions on it. So it was a very tough decision to, to shorten them down to, uh, to the function literals that, that, you have, that we have today. Yeah. It, it, sorry, you're uh, yeah. it does of the first part of that. Uh, of course, it doesn't get to the second. Yeah. Okay. But I, I like the the proposal of uh, the longer term proposal or the alternative, which is the, that the Go language will add support for shorter functional liter uh, literals that where the types or um, perhaps even the function the function declaration itself, but at least at least the types would be would be nice to be uh, able to leave out. And what I like about that alternative is if we change GU to do it in the new way where you have a sp uh, explicit uh, context and an explicit dimensions return type, then when this, then you can just shorten the code um, from that point on. It will be a backwards compatible change in the sense that we don't need any changes uh, on the GU side. Another option is you could write a GU compiler that runs on top of the <laughs> Sorry, I'll just be quiet now. <laughs> I've actually come up with, um, you've made me think of a middle ground, which might be possible, which is keep the current um, anonymous function that, um, what's the word, that, that inherits the variables from the parent scope. I forget uh, the exact word for this, but. Hmm? The closure? Yeah, uh, keep using closures, but then statically detect, or even at runtime detect, if any of them don't do what you expect them to do. Like, for example, not set the dimensions. Mm -hmm. Because isn't that the original, the, the source of the of this proposal? It's also an understanding problem. I, uh, when I went through this uh, proposal with Roger, he, he, uh, he mentioned that he had a very hard time understanding what was actually going on. Why wasn't every, anything returned? Why was this context reused? Why, why was it okay to reuse the context and so on? So it's also very, very ex much more direct and, and easy to explain what goes on in these uh, in these functions. You have this context in, and you what you return is is this dimensions. So I think that's also a very nice thing about uh, the proposal. I wonder if it would be possible to write helper functions that. Um, either that go one way or the other with the API so that if you like don't need constraints or don't want to return dimensions yourself, um, you could just write uh, a function closure with no arguments and it would somehow magically or automatically uh, inherit the constraints or, or, or the dimensions the way we do now with, with GTX. Um, perhaps I'm going to misunderstand, but that, I think that's already what happens. If I can just uh, see if I can uh, present again, just to make sure that I understand you correctly. Um, right. So I'm going to, again, to the, the changed kitchen example. So but you, with the new API, you still don't directly deal with constraints and dimensions. You just pass them on. So if, if, if we had this example, there's a, and um, you add an ins uh, a set of insets to a label, and you don't you get the context, and you have to return dimensions, but you you just pass on the context to the label, and return whatever dimensions it's, it's giving you. And the same thing applies to the inset itself that you just return to the rigid, which is part of um, this icon and label. Uh, this here flex. So you don't you don't actually deal with constraints and dimensions if you don't want to. It's just the proposal is just making it much more explicit um, 
that you which kind which constraints and which which context you're getting and that you have to return a set of dimensions so i've seen some code and i've i've done that by mistake myself where you in, inside a, a, a draw function or a layout function you actually end up drawing and laying out two things that end up on, on top of each other and you can't immediately understand why this is both a problem and why it happens but if you're forced to return something then you you may be able to be reminded that it has to return some dimensions and if you can't decide which of your two widgets you uh, you return you may be forced or nudged into to to looking into the problem more clearly in that way okay in some of your example code that you posted in the slack channel um it seemed like for a small widget i don't remember what 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 it was but it like there was it was uh maybe eight lines long and the first four lines were return this and then call a widget return that or call a widget return that it was like four returns in a row each mm -hmm. nested one among one one inside the other mm -hmm. and is that is that something that you've seen that's that's common or is that is that actually uncommon because it looks kind of clunky kind of annoying but it is and that's it, yes it is and that's why i have such so i've 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 been here before in the in the fall uh, where I wanted to do, um, where we had the explicit uh, context. It was, actually, it was actually a context and a constraints, and then you return dimensions in the fall. And this in this proposal, you you merge in the con constraints and the context in one, but you still had a lot of returns. And and that's the returns and the long type names are the reasons that I went for this uh, the thing that we have today. But I've just seen too many um, difficult to explain issues with it, and with at least with type aliases the the balances has has tipped in the in the favor of being more explicit, at least in my my opinion. So if I didn't have, for my personal taste, if if we didn't have the type aliases, then the returns and the type names would be too long for me uh, to to. Um, but but you're definitely correct. There's a there will be a, a few more returns, and it will be look it will look a little bit more clunky. But on the other hand, actually, uh, now we're speaking. Um, I think it was you, Larry, that wanted a way to replace the input queue for a certain widget. Is that true at some point? I know I did. Yes, I, I did want to yeah. do that. And I did actually figure out how to do that as long as, and it's, it's not that hard to do as long as you arrange for it uh, at the top of your event list and pass you yes. know, something in, other in than this, With this proposal with value types context, then it will be just be automatically, um, you can just change the context that you have, and then it will, be, it will only be used for this um, for the current context, uh, the, the current function, and whatever you're calling. So you will not have problems with changing a, an event queue and making sure that it has to be uh, set back to the old value or something like that. So, so use cases where you want to do a custom tweaking of the context before passing it on, it will naturally be supported uh, because the context is, uh, it will be turned into a, a value type or passed by value. It's, it's a, it's a struct type in itself, but it's passed by value instead of uh, appointed to it. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't so much the context. I don't think it was the actual event queue. And I think I was trying to f either filter the event queue or just omit it. I forget exactly why. Uh, off the top of my head, um, and putting a different event queue inside a context that you've already created was difficult. And like I said, you could you could do it, but you had to arrange for it uh, up top. Okay. When you when you when you when you assign the you had to remember because like you can't context has some unexported fields, and or at least it it does in, in master right now. Mm -hmm. um, but you can. But the idea is that you can. It's it will be now be possible to export those fields because whatever changes you do will will never affect uh, something that uh, that is calling you. Ah. Uh, okay. Well. Cool. Yeah. Right, so should we, um, I think we should end this. We've gone 30 minutes over the hour. So thank you very much for joining us. And I hope to um, see at least some of you uh, for the next month in the next month's call. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye, everyone.